Thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. I want to uh, take a quick uh, moment here to thank Biodiscovery for inviting me to give this webinar. And uh, before I get into the meat of the talk, I wanted to give you all a little bit of background on, on our lab, our Cytogenetics Laboratory uh, here at Iowa. We like to consider ourselves a translational genomics uh, laboratory because we have one arm that is clinical uh, and then another arm uh, in another building that is purely research. And uh, we also have a, a large number of both clinical and basic uh, research collaborators that we work with uh, on a routine basis. So our laboratory is kind of a small to medium sized cytogenetics laboratory. Uh, we do about 4,500 tests a year on about 3,000 patient samples. Uh, we have nine clinical laboratory scientists, uh, two secretaries, and two PhD level consultants. And the testing that we do uh, is on uh, multiple tissue types, uh, blood, bone marrow, uh, tumor tissue, amniotic fluid. We do prenatal, constitutional, and oncology testing. Uh, but it all comes down to really three uh, staple tests, uh, chromosomal analysis or sort of conventional uh, cytogenetics or the karyotype, fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH, and of course chromosomal microarrays. So our volume of chromosomal microarrays has certainly increased over the last several years, and this is in large part uh, due to the recommendations of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Uh, which came out a couple of years ago and said that uh, chromosomal microarray, either by uh, SNP arrays or CGH arrays, should be the first line or first tier clinical diagnostic test uh, for pediatric patients who have non-syndromic uh, intellectual disability or developmental delay, uh, multiple congenital anomalies not specific to a, a sort of a well-delineated syndrome, or patients uh, who fall somewhere on the autism spectrum uh, continuum. So our experience at the uh, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics so far has been that the most prevalent indication for chromosomal microarray is non-syndromic developmental delay or intellectual disability. And using our uh, previous platform, uh, which had a resolution of about uh, 100 KB, uh, we performed over 1,500 CMAs. And we had a, a diagnostic yield pretty similar to what's been published previously, where about 10% of our cases were what we kind of refer to as blatantly abnormal. These were ones in which we found known microdeletion or duplication syndromes, uh, such as like 22Q or the 16P11.2, uh, Williams syndrome deletions, things like that. And then about 15% of our cases we referred to as indeterminate, but what really these are, these are the cases where we had, where we found novel CMVs, which we referred to as variants of unclear clinical significance. Um, sometimes we're able to better classify those as either likely benign, or likely pathogenic, but many of them uh, are just sort of labeled as of uncertain significance. And then the rest uh, we report out as normal. So that's kind of what we, we've seen on the clinical side. On the research side, uh, the main phenotypes that we're studying are developmental delay and non-syndromic intellectual disability, uh, but also since a large uh, volume of our testing in the clinical lab is on uh, neoplasms, specifically hematopoietic malignancies, we also have been searching for recurrent, uh, novel recurrent genomic uh, lesions and abnormalities in leukemias as well as myeloma and myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, but we do have a large number of collaborators here at the University of Iowa, so we've had an opportunity to uh, perform copy number variant research in several solid tumors, such as neuroendocrine tumors, uh, in a disorder called brachioidal renal syndrome, which I'll talk a little bit about today, uh, schizophrenia, autism, left lip and palate, and uh, inherited vision disorders. So to give you a, uh, kind of a more depth as to what our CNV-based research strategy is, uh, you know, at the bird's eye view, you know, we always start with a genetic disease, and the ultimate goal is hopefully to get to some form of treatment or perhaps prevention. And that oftentimes follows a, a kind of a similar stepwise approach where the first step is to find genetic similarities in cases, those affected with the disorder, and how those are different from controls. Uh, this helps you to elucidate a candidate disease gene list, which then you can test in both in vitro and in vivo uh, model systems, where you can then test interventions, which hopefully can lead to clinical trials. So this is the stage that we're at right now. And uh, chromosomal microarrays play a very significant role in this. So we use the microarray data that we get from the clinical side um, as a substrate for new algorithm development uh, so that we can better detect 
topping number variations in a variety of different types of data, both microarray based and sequencing based. Once we've detected these copy number variants, um, our goal is to prioritize those that are most likely to be disease causing. Uh, for this we use a couple of different statistical tests, but predominantly we use information that's available in CMV databases like the database of genomic variants, uh, ISCA, Decipher, and so forth, which I'll get into a little bit later also. Uh, once we've found those CMVs that are most likely to be pathogenic or disease causing, uh, our goal then becomes which gene or genes within that uh, interval are likely to be those that are exerting the phenotypic effect or the disease effect. For that, we use a combination of protein-protein uh, interaction and network analysis, uh, expression and protein databases, as well as uh, haploinsufficiency uh, predictions. Uh, this ultimately results in a list of sort of prioritized genes, which then we will go back to those patients who had CMAs that were normal and sequence those genes using one of the high throughput methodologies, um, one of the next generation sequencing uh, techniques or chemistries to see if we can find novel sequence mutations with any of those genes that we can confirm by Sanger sequencing, uh, lending more evidence to that uh, particular gene as being uh, pathogenic. So today I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how we go about finding CNVs, annotating those CMVs and ultimately interpreting them for their uh, likelihood of being disease causing or possibly benign. So the very first step in any of this is of course uh, detecting CMVs within the data. So with microarray data, which is you know a very well established uh, methodology, is a very robust uh, methodology, there are a lot of uh, algorithms out there right now for detecting CMVs. Many of them though, are based on some common themes such as hidden Markov models, uh, circularly binary segmentation, but you know there are so many out there that I couldn't really cover all of them. The only other one I'll mention is the SEGMT algorithm which was developed by Nimblegen and that's because uh, most of our experience has been with Nimblegen uh, CGH arrays. Uh, but there are also now many algorithms that aim to detect copy number variants in sequence data, particularly exome sequencing data. And we had some experience now with Conifer, uh, XHMM, um, and very limited experience with some non-read depth approaches. Uh, the picture that I have over here, the top one is of actually microarray data, uh, but the bottom one is actually data from uh, a patient that was part of a much larger autism cohort. And what you're seeing is a copy number variant or uh, duplication that was detected using the Conifer algorithm. Uh, between breakpoints 1 and 2 at 15Q11.2. Uh, pretty popular locus that I think a lot of us in the field have become very familiar with uh, in, from the microarray data. But now regardless of what algorithm uh, you use to detect CMVs, whether it be from array data or from sequencing data, uh, there are some guidelines out there that uh, should be applied to that algorithm uh, to determine whether or not it's functioning at a level that's appropriate for clinical testing. So about a year and a half ago now, I think it was the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics that uh, published a series, I think it was two papers, um, sort of providing recommendations or guidelines for the performance of microarrays in a clinical setting. And uh, one of those guidelines was that uh, these microarrays should have the ability to detect CNVs greater than 400 kb in length on a genome-wide basis with greater than 99% analytical sensitivity and a less than 1% false positive rate. Now in the, in the manuscript, uh, the ACMG recommended having you know, somewhere between two or 300 well-characterized cases with unique CNVs that sort of covered as much as the genome you know, as you know, possible sort of you know, would be realistic. Um, but as you can imagine that with the diagnostic yield of CMA, this would still require a large number of cases. Uh, you know, likely over a thousand, and that's not even taking into account the fact that many of these are going to be recurrent CMVs. Like we tend to see 22Q and 16P uh, crop up quite a bit. So the challenge that we kind of posed to ourselves was, how would a small laboratory like ours uh, economically validate a chromosomal microarray platform on a genome-wide basis? Now, in the past, a lot of the chromosomal microarray validations that have been published were using uh, what we refer to as sort of single locus techniques like FISH, MLPA, or qPCR. And really, this is only providing information about true and false positives 
and only for the few genomic locations that were tested. So you're not really getting much information about true and false negatives. Uh, the other problem with these single locus techniques is that they're not high throughput enough um, to allow calibration at the same time as validation of different microarray metrics, uh, some of which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, things like log two ratios or possibly the minimum number of probes to include within uh, CMB in order for it to be called. So our solution to this problem, uh, which is just one solution, is that we use uh, higher resolution microarrays. In the example that I'll show today, uh, a 720,000 feature array to validate regions on a lower resolution microarray. So uh, in this case, a 385,000 feature array. Now the advantages to this approach is that it requires fewer than the several hundreds of cases. Um, we were able to accomplish uh, this with as few as 20. Uh, they do not necessarily have to have well-characterized unique CMBs. You can actually use some of the um, more common CMBs in this validation approach. But probably what it is most useful for is allowing the calculation of true and false positives and negatives genome-wide, and that's sensitivity and specificity or a false positive rate on a genome-wide scale. Uh, the other real advantage of this is because uh, since most of this is, is computer-aided, uh, we can concurrently calibrate uh, various microarray metrics, such as log two ratio thresholds or the minimum number of probes in a CMB call. So to give you an idea of sort of how we accomplish this comparison, so we took 20 cases and uh, patient cases and ran them on the 720K array as well as the 385K array. And then we called CMBs in these cases using the Nexus copy number FAST algorithm over a range of log two ratios. Uh, from 0.2 to 0.7 at 0 0.05 intervals. We then classified every probe, every uh, oligonucleotide probe on the 720K array and on the 385K array based on their participation in a CNV and in what type. So basically each probe got sort of a, a label of uh, 1, 0, or negative 1 depending on if it was present within a duplication, a diploid region, or a deletion respectively. Then we did our comparison comparing the, those regions on the 385 array to those regions on the 720K array so that we can generate true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative calls uh, based upon, you know, for the 385K array based on what was present in the 720K array. And this allowed us to output sensitivity and specificity for the 385K array at these various log two ratios. And from this we were able to generate receiver operator characteristic plots uh, which allowed us to find sort of the uh, sweet spot or the optimal uh, log two ratio that maximized sensitivity and specificity. Now the way this is you know, traditionally accomplished in ROC analysis is that on the ROC curve you find that one point sort of at the bend of the knee uh, that is closest to the zero one coordinate and that's your point of maximal sensitivity and specificity but for uh, our example, we actually had a sensitivity and specificity or a false positive rate that we wanted to meet based on the American College of Medical Genetics paper. Uh, and what we were able to uh, uh, conclude was that for CMVs greater than 400 KB, if we excluded those probes from regions of segmental duplication, and I'll kind of mention why we did that, we were able to achieve a sensitivity of 99.7% and a false positive rate of less than 0.1% if we used a log two ratio value of 0.4 for deletions and 0.35 for duplications. Now part of the reason we excluded probes from segmental duplication regions uh, is simply because we tended to see a, a sort of a blunted effect at segmental duplication regions and part of the reason for that is because the reference DNA that we use uh, for our CGH uh, experiments is a multi-individual reference. So there's multiple individuals uh, DNA present within that reference uh, it's great for uh, sort of diminishing the effect of rare CNVs in the reference individuals, uh, but it's not very good for sort of resolving CNVs that are occurring at these segmental duplication regions. So because those got blunted, they tended to uh, not be concordant across the two array platforms very often. But since the clinical significance of uh, CNVs in those in many of these segmental duplications regions is um, is difficult to interpret. Uh, we felt that it was still a valid uh, comparison. So uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention something about exome sequencing and CMV detection as exome sequencing is poised to become 
uh, a very dominant clinical diagnostic tool. Uh, obviously, the biggest advantage of exome sequencing is the ability to find uh, single nucleotide uh, variations in small insertion deletions or indel mutations. Uh, but there has been a lot of interest in finding copy number variation within exome sequencing. And the, uh, the real good news here is that um, for laboratories that are using uh, Nexus, if you can convert any type of uh, algorithms output into CNV calls, uh, you can import that into Nexus and sort of work it into the same workflow. So at the top picture here, uh, again, I have that same 15Q duplication shown. The middle picture is all of the CNVs that were called for that particular patient using the conifer algorithm from the exome sequencing data. And for each one of these, if it was a duplication, we simply assigned it an arbitrary positive number of 0.4. If it was a deletion, an arbitrary negative number of negative 0.4. And then we were able to directly load this into Nexus using a custom data type. And once we're able to do that, we can actually use the same methodology I just described to compare the CMV calls from the exome sequencing to the CMV calls in the same samples from the microarray data and evaluate the, them using the same ROC approach. Now, there are some very uh, big differences here, though, one being that many of the metrics that you might hope to calibrate are going to be different uh, for exome sequencing CMV algorithms and for microarray CMV algorithms, and it's going to depend on which algorithm you use. Um, it would also probably be more appropriate to use a CNV-based approach when you're comparing exome sequencing to microarray data as opposed to the sort of the hybrid CNV probe approach that we've used to compare microarray data. And that's simply because the uh, sequencing data is going to be, uh, in theory, higher resolution than the microarray data. And then also, because of some of that reference DNA bias that I mentioned before, uh, whether you use a one individual reference or a multiple individual reference, um, there can be different biases either way. So SNP array data is where they're using sort of a static, you know, multiple individual reference might be more appropriate for these comparisons than CGH. Uh, but we're still sort of in the process of evaluating that. So that's all I wanted to cover on CMV detection. And now I want to talk a little bit about CMV annotation, which is this uh, bottom picture that I'm showing here. These are all of the different uh, annotation tracks that we use to help us, um, to help us basically uh, associate information that's going to help us in the interpretation phase with every CMV that we find. So probably just as important, or even more important, uh, uh, than the question of is this CMV causing disease, is the question is the CMV not causing disease, or is this a benign CMV? In fact. If you ask that question first, you're able to exclude numerous CNVs from any particular patient and allows you to really focus in on just those that are either novel or known to be pathogenic. Um, so how do you determine uh, whether or not a CNV is benign uh, in the first place? Well, probably the most common way of doing that is to determine what CNVs are present in normal individuals. Um, hard to define what normal is, so really more accurately what we're, uh, we're saying here is that what CMVs are present in control populations, so populations that have been used as controls in studies of uh, the phenotypes that we're interested in, whether they be uh, cognitive phenotypes um, uh, such as autism or intellectual disability or developmental delay. Um, in most of these experiments, we presume that the controls do not have significant uh, congenital disease, um, and it's probably safe to rule out uh, variation that's extremely common as opposed to variation that's maybe uh, less common or rare, present in only 0.5% uh, of controls, for example. So the, the information sources or the databases that we use uh, to help us to determine whether or not CMV is benign uh, include uh, two uh, publications, one being the uh, 2010 Conrad et al. publication in Nature, uh, and then also the uh, Cooper uh, publication from last year, I guess it's actually about, a, I guess, 2011 now, uh, where they looked at nearly uh, 15, uh, there were several thousands of individuals with uh, developmental delay and uh, intellectual disability. So we use the data sets from these two manuscripts, but then we also use information present within the International Standards for Cytogenomic Arrays, or the ISCA database, uh, the database of genomic variants, our own uh, local 
uh, database uh, based on all the cases that we've done. And then to a limited degree, the Decipher database. And the only reason I say limited is just because we uh, are not able to sort of do a bulk download of all of the data in Decipher. So the way in which we use these databases is we set up uh, rules. And these rules then dictate which CMVs within those databases or those information sources that we would consider to be benign. So for the Conrad data set, we say any of the CMVs that they validated that happen to be in the same direction, so duplications, we would not attempt to rule out a deletion as being benign simply because they found a duplication in the same region. So any validated CMV from that manuscript or uh, any uh, annotated segdupe in an autosomal region. For the database of genomic variants, uh, some of the rules and the ways in which we set those up are based on the frequency of a particular CMV uh, within a control population or within all of the populations present within the DGV. So uh, these rules were actually set up for a research study that I'm going to show a little bit later on. But if we uh, found a CMV in the uh, database of genomic variants greater than 1% frequency and observed three independent times, or greater than 0.5% frequency and observed five independent times, uh, we considered that to be benign. But we only uh, uh, looked at those studies where there was greater than 30 controls and the studies that were microarray studies themselves. And the Cooper data set, there had, it had to be present in uh, greater than or equal to 12 control samples and in what's called a non-significant gene, and that's actually language from the manuscript itself, uh, which I won't go into today. In the ISCA database, it had to be present in greater than or equal, or it had to be called benign in the ISCA database, uh, greater than or equal to eight times, or a variant of unclear uh, significance, likely benign, and then we would consider it to be benign, or in our own database at greater than 2% frequency. So uh, once you kind of have a framework for uh, you know, interrogating and parsing these databases with these rules, creating custom tracks to import into Nexus is actually quite easy. Um, and I have a kind of an example right here. So using data from the Cooper uh, publication, if you can create a bed type of a file with your chromosomes, your start and your stop positions, as well as whatever your uh, annotation of interest is, you can load this into Nexus as an annotation track. So here we have information directly from that publication uh, for CMVs that they found. And we have it in sort of a bed-like format. And then down here in the probe mapping descriptors text file, we simply tell Nexus where to look in this bed file for the information that it needs. So down at the bottom of the second picture, actually it's the third picture, you might see a entry that says Cooper Gaines, which is in reference to the bed type file that we've shown here. And we're basically just telling Nexus what the file name is. It's a tab delimited file. Um, and where to look, what columns to look for the chromosome, the start and the end. And what's really nice is that we can also assign it an individual group. And that just helps to sort of make a much cleaner interface for when we're selecting these. So here you can see an inset or a, a screenshot of the options menu in Nexus, the track selection uh, area, where you can now see the data from the Cooper paper as well as several other uh, data sources are organized into these nice little box groups to allow us to sort of more easily check these off in, uh, in groups, which is what we tend to do. So in addition to creating CNV annotation tracks, we can also create custom CNV tracks. So these would be tracks like uh, the ones that come default with Nexus, such as the more stringent DGV or the NG42M CNVE tracks. So here, we. Uh, we're showing how we've created what we call the ultimate duplication or the ultimate deletion track. So these are basically tracks that were created using those rules uh, that I presented just a minute ago. And by selecting these, we can then use this as our CMV track in Nexus instead of like the more stringent DGV, which allows us to take full advantage of this percent of overlap function in Nexus. And to illustrate that, here's kind of an example. So in this example, we've uh, we are using our ultimate duplications track for our CMV track. And uh, we're finding in this patient a duplication of the STS gene. Um, so this is actually the reciprocal duplication of the, of the deletion that actually causes steroid sulfatase deficiency. 
So uh, I'm sure most people who have done this kind of work have seen this duplication before. Um, there are definitely uh, camps that think that it's uh, benign and others that think that it may or may not be influencing uh, phenotype to some degree. But based on the rules that we had set up previously, here, this is actually shown, shown in the percent of CMV overlap column as 100% overlap with what we would consider to be a benign CMV. And that is because, as you can see in this uh, other sort of more highly focused window, it's been called as benign in the ISCA database uh, greater than or equal to eight times. So that's just kind of an example of how you can set up those rules. And then those rules can then help you to very quickly uh, filter out CNVs that you would consider to be benign based on the rules that you set up. So all of the tools that I've talked about here so far today, whether they be for the uh, validation or for uh, creating these custom CNV tracks, uh, we're in the process of distributing these to the Galaxy tool shed so they can be used in, a, in, a, in what I hope is a familiar interface to a lot of people within this field. Uh, and lastly, I want to talk about CNV interpretation. So, you know, once you've excluded it as being uh, likely benign, those that are left over, how can you best interpret those as to their likelihood of being uh, pathogenic versus sort of novel or rare normal variation? To do this, I want to talk about a, a very focused research project on branchial renal syndrome. So. Branchial syndrome, or BOR, uh, is a genetic condition that leads to malformations of the ear and hearing loss, uh, branchial fistula and cysts, and renal malformations. And without the renal malformations, it's referred to just as BOS. Now, this is a disease that's known to be autosomal dominant, and it's due to mutations in uh, three genes, EYA1, 6, 5, and 6, 1. About 40% of the cases are caused by EYA1 mutations, and then about 5% caused by mutations in 6, 1, or 6.5, although mutations in 6.5 have sort of been called into question recently as a cause of BOR. But, but if, when we first set out to study this phenotype, there were no large-scale studies of copy number variants in BOR. So we set out to define the frequency of, you know, if there are EY1 deletions. And then also, and this is, you know, the exciting part, see if we could find new uh, loci that when haploinsufficient could be a cause of BOR. So our research design was we took 32 uh, individuals with BOR who had previously been sequenced for mutations in EY1, 6.1, or 6.5, and were negative. We used 2.1 million feature CGH arrays from Nimblegen that had a medium probe spacing of about 1 to 2 kb. And this was uh, the methodology that we used to find copy number variants. The problem that we realized very quickly in uh, doing this was that the same algorithms and the same um, sort of calling criteria that we used clinically for our lower resolution arrays like the 385 or the 720K weren't working very well with these uh, 2.1 million arrays. And we also were in kind of a, a position where we couldn't find a lot of higher resolution arrays to do the same type of validation. So we used an approach that was uh, kind of prevalent in the literature at the time, which was to use multiple algorithms and then look for concordance. So we used three algorithms to call CNVs in this data set, the, the FAST and the RANK algorithms from Nexus, as well as the SEGMT algorithm from uh, the, the software that's produced by uh, Nimblegen. So we called CNVs using all three of these algorithms, and then we chose just those regions that were found to be copy number variable across all three of the algorithms. And this provided us with a set of CNVs that met several biologic criteria, such as uh, more deletions, than duplications, uh, a believable distribution of polymorphic CNVs to unique or rare CNVs, as well as an appropriate sort of distribution amongst uh, exonic sequence and intronic and intergenic sequence. I do want to take a little bit of time just to show you how easily you can do this multiple CNV calling algorithm approach in Nexus. So here I have a picture, this top one here, of a Nexus project, and the first three files that you see here are the same uh, sample that's been called with three different algorithms. And I have just a factor over here that says segmentation, that says which algorithm it was called with, either the rank, the fast, or the segmt. So I select those, I view those, and I use the aggregate function 
to view all of those CMVs that were found, or CMV regions that were found in 100% of the samples. And I can do that by simply setting the aggregate percent cutoff at 100%. Once you've done this, uh, you can click the export text button, and you get a text file like this top picture here, which has all of those CMV regions that were found in 100% uh, of those three different uh, CMV call sets. And you have to do very little manipulation of this file to be able to load it back into Nexus. Really, all you have to do is get these top two lines gone or erased, and then everywhere where it says CNV or CN gain, change that to an arbitrary positive number, CN loss, change that to an arbitrary negative number, and then you create a custom data type in the custom data types file uh, that's you know, very simple. A uh, uh, fourth line down on this bottom picture, you can see an entry that says Darbro. That's the name we gave it. Uh, the full location of the CMV, uh, we're telling Nexus to look under the column called region, uh, which is shown up here in this uh, top picture. And then for the log to ratio, look under the column that says event, which we changed these to be 0.4 and negative 0.4. Once you've done that, created the custom data type, you can load these files directly back into Nexus. And now you have a very high quality set of copy number variable regions uh, that were concordant across three different uh, CMV calling algorithms. And you can visualize them like this or like this in Nexus. So that was how we found CMVs. So then our next step was to prioritize those that were most likely to be disease causing for BOR. And uh, we used those rules that I showed previously to exclude about 98% 90, of all the CMVs we found as being benign, or at least in this case, unlikely to be causing BOR. Um, and then those that remained that involved greater than one, or greater than zero, I'm sorry, RefSeq genes, we considered those to be diagnostic. And if they're greater than a megabase or a known pathogenic or susceptibility locus, we called them abnormal. Uh, and if they didn't meet the abnormal criteria, we called them variants of unclear significance. So what we found was actually uh, kind of surprising at the time, but ends up uh, being kind of consistent with uh, patients who have uh, sort of renal malformations. We found that in 17 of these 32, there was what we considered to be a diagnostic lesion. Uh, 10 of those 17 we considered to be very likely causative, nine of them being novel. And then the remaining seven of the 17 were either known susceptibility loci, or variants of unclear significance. But four of those seven were also novel. And then in addition to this, we found about 52 other, what we considered interesting, unique deletions and duplications, but they were much smaller, uh, less than you know about uh, 50 kb, so somewhere in that sort of 10 to 50 kb range. So one of the things we found was four unrelated individuals that had the same, or what looked to be the same, large deletion on chromosome 8 that involved the EYA1 gene and then a fifth individual that actually had a deletion that involved just the three prime end of EYA1. We used the stack method or the significance testing and aberrant copy number uh, states uh, algorithm to assess the significance of this recurrent deletion in our cohort and found that it was with a p-value of 0 .009 and that algorithm is available in Nexus. And then when we went in and sequenced the breakpoints we found that they were nearly identical in all four patients and happened to involve two retroviral sequence blocks, suggesting that uh, this recurrent deletion was a result of non-allelic homologous recombination. The real interesting part was these novel CMVs that we found uh, across four chromosomes, uh, 7, 8, 2, and 11, uh, that were over a megabase in size, and in total had over 300 potential genes that may be causing the BOR phenotype. So the question became then, how can we maybe better get an idea as to which of those genes within those novel large CMV intervals are contributing the most to the BOR phenotype? And to help us with that, we used uh, an analysis method called CMV overlap analysis, haploinsufficiency sufficiency prediction, as well as protein-protein uh, interaction network or pathway analysis in combination with the published C. elegans interactome. So for the overlap analysis, we went back to those same uh, sort of uh, databases or data sources that I talked about before, but this time we only went back to those that had, you know, affected patients, not simply controls. So for that, it was pretty much Decipher, ISCA, and the publication by Cooper et al. 
And here you can see a shot from the UCSC uh, genome browser where we have one of the deletions we found, novel deletions, this one from chromosome 8. And here you can see all of the deletions from these other databases or data sources that overlapped with this deletion. The thought being is that those genes that were present in these regions of maximal or moderate overlap would probably be the most likely to exert a sort of a phenotypic effect on humans. So of the 60 or so genes within this novel chromosome 8 deletion, about 30 were present in this region of what we consider to be moderate overlap. Uh, the next thing we did was we used a haploinsufficiency prediction analysis which had been published uh, by another group previously to score each of the genes within this interval for their likelihood of being haploinsufficient. Now for comparison, EYA1 and 6 one had scores of 0.82. Uh, now of all of the genes in this interval for which we could generate a score, those scores only ranged from 0.65 to 0.04, but ultimately we used this in sort of a ranking uh, algorithm, so those genes at the 0.65 region got a higher rank for this particular analysis. And now I won't spend any time talking about the pathway analysis uh, that we perform simply because it, it gets uh, pretty in-depth, uh, but it probably suffices to say that we use this in the same way, basically as a way of ranking genes within the interval for their likelihood to be involved with the BOR phenotype, and in the pathway sense, uh, that was done by looking at how closely they could be connected to EYA1 or other known BOR genes. So for this chromosome 8 deletion, the results of all three of these analyses sort of pointed to the same candidate, which is Sharpen, or CIPL-L1, which it turns out actually is known to be an EYA1 binding partner and involved in craniofacial development in mice. So sort of a proof of principle that this type of an uh, analytic approach could be helpful for finding uh, potentially pathogenic genes within large CMB intervals. So in, a, in summary of that particular project, we did find what looks like to be a recurrent uh, deletion that involves EYA1 that can be causing BOR. And we also, in addition to Sharp and Keem, uh, up with a couple of additional genes that might be very good candidates for the BOR phenotype. So now we're sequencing those in many other BOR uh, patients for which we do not have a genetic diagnosis yet. So that's everything I had uh, to talk about today. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the Shiva Patil Cytogenetics and Molecular Laboratory uh, who are involved in all of the clinical testing as well as much of the research testing. Uh, Agshin, who is our uh, coordinator of the research arm of our laboratory, as well as our collaborators, uh, John Manick, Pat Brophy, and Richard Smith, uh, who were all involved in the BOR project. And I've also included my contact information down here if anybody would like um, any kind of early access to any of those tools, if you're comfortable uh, using the command line. Uh, but otherwise, uh, our friends at Biodiscovery have informed me that as soon as those tools are made available, uh, that they'll be happy to email or send out an email distribution to the people who have signed up for this webinar. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Meeting in the polls. Uh, we'll go to questions now. Please feel free to continue typing them in. Um, Dr. Narbro, in your discussion on how you use the ROC analysis to find optimal settings, will these settings be applied to other platforms such as Affymetrix and Illumina or are they specific to your platform? So they are specific to our platform um, and in some uh, cases they are not only um, manufacturer platform specific, so in this case NimbleGen, but also to you know some degree our own laboratory's uh, methodology and sort of workflow specific. Um, I wouldn't recommend using those particular log to ratio values for an Affymetrix or a Luminar array. The methodology itself though is uh, robust and can be applied to uh, both uh, CGH and SNP arrays. Um, in fact, we, uh, as part of the review process for the manuscript that we submitted, we're actually repeating this uh, using some of these other SNP platforms uh, such as the Affymetrics and the Illumina arrays uh, to prove as much and maybe some of those results will be more applicable on a general uh, setting uh, but I would still recommend that every laboratory do their own uh, sort of validation concurrent calibration uh, because those results might be different. Um, is it possible to get the haploinsufficient sufficient genes track? So yes, um, uh, on the Decipher website, uh, they have all of the haploinsufficiency scores 
uh, for the genes that it can be calculated for on their website in a sort of a browser format that you can visually see. Uh, but we actually got them just from the manuscript itself. Uh, in the supplementary data that comes with that paper, there is actually uh, just an Excel file that has, excuse me, a list of um, all of the genes for which the score can be calculated, as well as the score. Uh, and it's in a pretty easily modifiable format that you know can be used to create either a, a type of a track or used as a substrate for other um, uh, utilities. Uh, can you explain why the reference bias can be avoided using SNP arrays rather than array CGH? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's the uh, it's in a way it's it's avoiding one type of bias more than it is avoiding all bias. Um, so with CGH arrays, you kind of have two choices. You can either use a single individual as your reference DNA, or you can use a pool of individuals as your reference DNA. And each of those sort of creates a different type of uh, data bias. If you use a single individual, anywhere that single individual has a unique or a comp or an uncommon CNV, uh, the reciprocal of that is going to show up in most of your uh, patients that you test. So that's sort of a, a one bias uh, that can be avoided by using a SNP array because you don't have that sort of uh, reciprocal bias from using the one individual reference using CGH. If you use a pooled reference, uh, anywhere from 6, 7, 10, 20 individuals DNA, those types of CMVs are going to be, are going to be less of an issue uh, when you're testing patients. But the type of CMVs then that become an issue are the segmental duplications, which again, clinically, you know, it's questionable how important those are, are going to be, maybe simply because we can't interpret them very well yet. But um, when you use a pooled sample, anywhere where uh, you have a segmental duplication locus, you're going to have probably multiple genotypes in that pool of individuals, which is then ultimately going to blunt uh, any kind of a log two shift in your patient um, in comparison to the multiple genotype sort of mix. Uh, now that's something that, you know, again, it's, that may still be present to some degree in some of the SNP arrays, depending on the type of reference that's used or multi uh, static multi-individual data reference used. Uh, whether it be a, an Affymetrix or an Illumina type of array. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, what kind of exome-based CNV precision and recall rates are you seeing with Conifer and XHMM? How do you choose what to believe? So um, right now we're still in the process of, of, of making those uh, making that comparison and doing the, the ROC analysis in the comparison between the exome data, exome sequence data and the microarray data. Um, I can say that uh, I do have very high hopes uh, in part because uh, the cohort that we've done this on uh, was an autism cohort and many of the CMVs that we're picking up in the exome sequencing data are CMVs that have been associated with autism uh, previously in microarray data. So. We know it's finding CMVs of clinical interest and utility, um, exactly how uh, concur uh, concordant the results are between the microarray and the exome sequencing. We're still in the process of evaluating that and also evaluating it in sort of a different array context, uh, sort of exome sequencing compared to CGH arrays or SNP arrays. Okay. Uh, I am using Cytoscan microarray from Affymetrics. Can I use the Nexus copy number software? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we, uh, we've used it for Affymetrix Cytoscan HD uh, arrays. Um, in fact, it uh, provides for a lot of different um, kind of analysis options. You can uh, import the raw cell files. You can uh, import chip files um, at different stages of the analysis. Either you can perform some of the analysis in the CHAS software from Affymetrix or in Nexus. Um, so yeah, certainly you can use Nexus with those uh, arrays and there's a lot of versatility and flexibility that comes along with that. Can I use pooled DNA as a reference in calling CNVs uh, simple gains and losses? Um, if I'm understanding the question right, uh, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, uh, I'm not sure what simple means, but if we're talking about non-seg-dupe or sort of regions of the genome that are known to be copy number variable, a pooled reference works very well 
uh, because it does minimize that reference bias with regards to rare or uncommon CNGs. Is the Haplo software for genes free? Oh yeah, I mean it's not even um, software per se. Uh, the the authors um, who I am forgetting at this point in time, I think it was uh, Matt uh, Hurl's group um, from uh, the Wellcome Trust, but uh, they uh, the, it's not really software per se. They've actually calculated these scores for all the genes already, and you can simply download those. Now the software that we've created. Um, all the tools that we've created, uh, some of which use haplon sufficiency uh, scores, uh, that will all be free and uh, distributed on uh, in the Galaxy uh, tool shed uh, in the near future. Okay. Do you think the capture efficiency for the exome sequence could skew your results? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's why a lot of the current algorithms, such as like Conifer or XHMM, um, have very at least in my, you know, in my limited uh, sort of statistical uh, experience, uh, very sort of elaborate normalization methods uh, for the read depth. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there are going to be features of the capture, whether that be uh, different batches or GC content that are going to affect how much gets pulled down and sort of how much ultimately ends up getting sequenced. So I believe in Conifer it's a singular value decomposition uh, normalization, and I think in XHMM they use a type of PCA, principal component analysis based normalization. So yeah, that's certainly uh, an issue, but it's, it's, it's one that's always sort of addressed up front in some of the more uh, popular algorithms uh, up to day. How reliable are gains and losses of less than 100 kb? Um, going to depend a little bit on the on the methodology, the platform that you're using, as well as a variety of, of sort of something that I haven't talked about today, which is uh, other QC parameters. Um, I think that uh, it's a difficult question to answer without you know sort of doing your own validation. Um, in our experience, they tend to be you know, just as reliable as far as a real or a false uh, uh, positive uh, standpoint as some of the bigger ones. Um, but a lot of that comes down to, you know, the resolution. Like if you're using a 385,000 feature array, uh, the 100 KB or less uh, CMBs are going to be a little less reliable simply because the resolution of the array is not such that it allows for detection of that small CMB. But if you're using, say, a 2.1 million feature array, you can have a little bit more confidence in those uh, smaller calls, but again, it's going to have a limit of detection also. That's where the validation part is really important so that you can ultimately say at the end of the day, at what level do you actually believe uh, that this CMV is real? And uh, in the tools that we've developed, it's actually very easy to say, you know, calculate our sensitivity and specificity for CMVs of 400 KB or for those that are larger than 100 KB or 50 KB. We used 400 KB because that was what the size was in the ACMG paper. In the low resolution example of using more than one software to validate calls, can you perform these multiple algorithm analyses within Nexus? Is it a simple method selection? Yeah, so uh, again, if I understand the question, correct, or the question correctly, um, what we end up doing is we, uh, we take our data files, we load them up into Nexus and we call them with one algorithm, say the FAST algorithm. And then we highlight all of those cases and we duplicate them. Now when you duplicate them in a Nexus project, they're actually unprocessed. So at that point we just go up to the settings menu, change the algorithm that's going to be used for processing the samples to, you know, say like the rank algorithm, and now reprocess those duplicated ones using the rank algorithm. Now for for CMV calling algorithms that exist outside of Nexus, like the SEGMT or any others, you have to make the calls, the CMV calls, outside of Nexus, and then import the segmented uh, data files into Nexus. So in the case of the uh, SEGMT files that we use, uh, those get segmented by uh, Nimblegen software, NimbleScan, and actually create a file type that gets directly uh, loaded into Nexus. And you know, then we just need to keep track of which, uh, which files within the Nexus project were called with, say, the FAST, or the rank, or the SEGMT, and that's pretty easily done just by adding a, a 
one factor that just is responsible for keeping track of which algorithm we use, was used to analyze that case. How much sequencing data is required to make precise or good CNV estimates? Let's assume 100 BP PE alumina. So, um, that's a good question. And uh, that'll probably be one of the um, uh, factors that we try to calibrate in our comparison. Um, as far as the depth of coverage goes, uh, I don't know if I have a, I don't think I have a good answer for that right now. Uh, I can say that as far as the number of samples go, uh, the more samples that you analyze, the better off you're going to be. In fact, you know, many of the early attempts that we uh, made to use these uh, CMB calling algorithms and exome sequencing data when we had very few exome sequences to begin with um, were kind of, uh, we didn't do any, uh, you know, really thorough uh, validation, but they were a little suspect. They were, uh, you know, occurring in regions of the genome that we've never seen copy number variation in before. Uh, big, you know, CNVs that just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, as we started to add more and more cases, though, I think some of the normalization methods worked a little bit better, so we were able to get a little bit more what we consider at this stage to be reliable results. Uh, but we're still kind of in the process of doing that comparison. Uh, but that will be one of the metrics that we, we try and calibrate is uh, sort of probably average read depth or median read depth uh, for an exome. Do you think that some hits that are excluded as benign could actually be real? Why or why not? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that the, in medicine there, there are very few absolutes. Um, and I think that uh, the ones that we exclude as benign, um, I would say it's very unlikely that those are causing the, the types of significant congenital disease that we're seeing, um, simply because they're usually prevalent CNVs. They're present in too much of the population to be causing uh, a really rare disease. Um, that said, it's possible that they could be sort of minor susceptibility loci or sort of modifying loci, meaning that uh, by themselves, uh, they are insufficient to cause some of the diseases that we study, but in combination with other CNVs or other uh, sequence mutations, uh, they may be contributing an overall burden uh, to the individual at a genetic level that's manifesting as disease. In fact, this idea of a sort of multi-hit or uh, two-hit hypothesis for some types of uh, neurocognitive diseases like intellectual disability and autism, I think is a hypothesis that's gaining a lot of uh, uh, traction right now. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Darbro. Uh, as we're running out of time now, I'm going to um, stop this at this point. And on behalf of Biodiscovery, I'd like to thank Dr. Darbro for doing these um, three webinar sessions for us. Very generous of you. Um, and before we end here, I just want to remind everyone about the uh, browser window that will open up. So feel free to type in any additional questions there, and we'll follow up with you via email. And also, for any customers or anyone else who's interested um, in some new features in the version 7 of Nexus Copy Number coming out soon, we are holding a few webinar sessions at the end of the month, February 27th through March 1st, so feel free to sign up for those. You'll find it posted 